Bom dia, good morning, everyone. Yeah, welcome to the Brazil Canada workshop on offshore renewable energy. To those who are uh, participating in person and those who are participating and following us from the uh, YouTube channel of Gero. So uh, it's a pleasure having you here. And uh, I would like to invite the, uh, actually, the, for opening uh, remarks, starting with Professor Sejane, please, and Bruce Cameron from PAMEC, and uh, Daniela Massa from the government of the state of Rio de Janeiro. And we have actually two uh, online participation, Lizen from uh, Meru Renewables Canada and uh, Laura from the Canadian Consulate of, in Rio de Janeiro. It's okay now. Okay, we have uh, some people attending online and uh, for those, uh, good day and good morning for the people here. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to these uh, presentations, discussions, and interactions on a very uh, interesting topic uh, related to energy transition that is the offshore renewable energy, uh, a new frontier for the efforts to decarbonize the world electrical matrix. Uh, special thanks to Bruce Cameron, uh, our visitor from Canada, uh, president of the Pan American Marine Energy Association. We also acknowledge the presence of uh, Daniel Lamassa, uh, representing the Secretary of Energy of the state of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Daniel is responsible for economy in, in the sea and related topics. And uh, it's uh, thank you very much for coming and stay with us this morning. And uh, also the efforts of uh, Dr. Mila Shadma and the collaborators from uh, GERO for organizing uh, this uh, workshop. Also, our thanks to the Canada General Consulate in Rio for supporting the event. I think uh, uh, Laura will be with us uh, online to say a few words later. COPY has worked for decades in research activities related to deep water technologies for oil and gas. We believe that this background is valuable for the technological basis needed to design, construct, install, and operate the offshore renewable devices. From wind power and floating solar to the conversion of ocean sources such as waves, tides, currents, temperature gradient, and salinity gradient how to implement the associated technology with competitive costs are our focus today. I hope you enjoyed the workshop. Thank you very much for being here, both in uh, presence and uh, online. I will pass now to Bruce Cameron for a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sagan. Um, I'm not sure how the slides are going to work. Uh, yeah, no, the, the microphone there. I, just a few a few words about the Pan American Marine uh, Energy Association. Uh, we were founded about five years ago uh, as as part of a, a collaborative network uh, between Europe and Asia and now in the Americas. And it's all a focus on research and collaboration in marine renewable energy technologies. And that encompasses everything from 
uh, ocean thermal currents, wind, wave, tidal, um, offshore wind, uh, has in, in, in our terms is part of that family. And we connect researchers and uh, government and industry globally to discuss the kinds of things that need, the problems that need to be solved and the solutions uh, to be able to have marine renewables part of the constellation of the decarbonization technologies and opportunities uh, for the world. Um, our association is focused on the Americas and I'll be reporting a little bit later on what's happening. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for the invite. I'm speaking on behalf of the Secretary Hugo Leal, and I'm representing the Rio, Rio de Janeiro state government and the newly created Secretary of Energy and Maritime Economy. This is very important to be here in this workshop because we are in the heart of technology and knowledge of Rio de Janeiro state. And the offshore um, energy for us is totally, is, is the most important one because we have oil and gas, but now we're looking for the offshore wind. We have nine projects on our coast being licensed by IBAMA. And this, this total projects are almost 28 gigawatts of potency. And we have the tidal energy and we have potential for the wave energy as well. So this is very important. And I like to, to hope everyone has a, have a very good workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. I will call now uh, Listen from Canada online. Listen is from the Marine Renewable Canada. Please listen. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if you can see me. Am I coming through? OK. Hi, everyone. I'm Listen Bassett. Uh, I'm coming to you from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, and I represent Marine Renewables Canada today. So we are the National Organization for Marine Renewable Energy in Canada. Um, thank you for having us. We're super happy to be talking about the, uh, you know, all the opportunities that exist between Brazil and Canada, both really exciting emerging markets in terms of offshore wind and other marine renewable energy. Um, so we represent about 160 members, technology developers, including offshore wind. We have academic institutions, indigenous groups, um, really a wide variety of, uh, of organizations that we represent. And we do as much as we can to promote the growth of marine renewable energy in Canada. Uh, we do policy advocacy, public education. Uh, we try to help our members uh, with supply chain development, uh, getting the information out there about who is doing what in the industry. And we do international business development as well. Um, so we're very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to the workshop today. Thank you. Thank you, Listen. Uh, I think uh, Laura will enter online or so. Please, Mila. Mila. Could you connect her? No. Okay, Laura is driving and in, in, is in the traffic jump and probably not able to connect now, but, uh, oh, connect. Laura. Laura. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Oh, yes, nice. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, sorry for the connection here. I'm we, uh, in the university already, but I haven't been able to reach the location. I'm sorry for that. I'm driving. So, uh, so I believe this demonstrates the need for marine transportation in Rio. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so just uh, wanted to say a few words. Uh, so uh, we have the Consulate General of Canada in Rio de Janeiro, but we also have a Consulate General in Sao Paulo, uh, our embassy in Brasilia, yes. and also uh, uh, three trade offices uh, of Canada in Brazil, uh, one located in Recife, another one in Porto Alegre, and a third one in Belo Horizonte. 
So we have a, a, a good presence here in Brazil. So uh, my role is to uh, foster uh, connections between Brazil and Canada in the energy sector and uh, supporting Canadian companies that try to do business in Brazil or universities trying to establish connections with the Brazilian uh, sector and also uh, the government relations. In addition to that, we also help companies uh, from Brazil interested in investing in Canada, establishing a presence in Canada. So uh, in Canada and Brazil have a lot of synergies in the power sector, uh, especially uh, because uh, we have uh, both an electricity mix, which is very similar. We have a lot of uh, hydroelectricity in Canada and uh, long uh, distance transmission lines and a lot of renewables, uh, which is growing a lot in Canada. And Canada uh, also has a lot of interest in uh, offshore renewables. Uh, we, I, I'm sure you must have heard about the Fundy Bay uh, located uh, in between Nova Scotia and New, New Brunswick. It's uh, one of the greatest, uh, I think it's the greatest variation of uh, tide in the world. Uh, so, uh, and we have, a, I think it's worth mentioning the, the work done by the FORCE. It's a research institute in the location. Uh, it's intended to test technologies and the impact on the environment. It's uh, connected to the, the to the power grid, to the transmission lines in the location. So there, uh, companies can test uh, technologies in real life situations. And uh, to that, uh, Canada has a lot of uh, engineering uh, know-how and expertise uh, in this area of shore wind but uh, tidal wave energy as well. So we are hoping that as a result of this event that we are able to establish closer links with Brazil in this area. Okay, so I hope you have a great event. I'm going to be there soon. And thank you very much, Professor Sejain, Milad, Professor Milad, uh, Bruce, uh, and also the Marine Renewables Association for all the support. I would like also to greet uh, the, the Secretary of Rio de Janeiro, represented by Daniel, I believe. Uh, right, Daniel? I'm sorry, I'm not there to. <laughs> so I, I'm a bit, uh, I can't uh, read uh, the, your name now, but uh, I hope you have a great event and thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. We hope we'll be here soon. Okay, to we'll see you here. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, I think uh, uh, we can pass directly for the presentations. The, the first presentation is from uh, Professor Dr. Milad Shadman. He will talk about the activities in uh, R&D by GERO. It's a group that we founded uh, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago about renewables. Thank you very much. Milad, please. Okay, just testing the Assim? Bom, não estou conseguindo. Ah, agora sim. Sorry, good morning everyone. My name is Milad Shadman and I'm a professor in Ocean Engineering Department at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So I'm uh, going to show an overview at our, uh, for, uh, about our activities, research and development activities in our group, which is the uh, Offshore Renewable Energy Group, Grupo de Energia Renovável no Oceano, Giro of COPE, uh, UFRJ. So I divided uh, our activities actually in four principal uh, 
categories here, uh, talking about the resource potential in Brazil, talking about the marine renewables, activities in the marine renewables, offshore wind and hydrogen production from offshore wind. So when we talk about the offshore renewable potential, we can consider different uh, categories about the potential. We have theoretical potentials when we consider all the economic exclusive zone uh, can be used for uh, installing our system. Then we applied some technical and environmental restrictions and uh, 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 we actually recalculate this potential. So we have technical potential and we have economical potential for those regions that we have uh, uh, viable actually and feasible economy of such system. Uh, actually, we have some studies about the complementarity and synergy between different offshore renewable resources that I'm going to show you here. First of all, uh, when we talk about the offshore renewable energy, we can divide it in two, two categories. The first category is sources from seawater that commonly called marine energy, right? Uh, these are, uh, sorry, include, <clears throat> this include, uh, okay, this include wave energy, uh, current energy, tidal, uh, current, tidal amplitude, thermal gradient, and salinity gradient. There are six sources uh, that we call marine energy. And we have another sources of energy. They are not from seawater, but we can actually take advantage using the ocean space that are offshore wind and floating solar that installed in the marine environment, right? Okay, this is the first work that we've done and we published in 2019 about the ocean renewable uh, energy potential along the Brazilian coastline. The first uh, figure here showing the co uh, ocean current energy, we can see that uh, uh, we don't have really high velocity ocean currents along the Brazilian coastline, but we can observe at the north and northeast of Brazil, we have a good velocities. However, these velocities occurred in about 100 kilometers to 200 kilometers far from the shoreline. Uh, it involves a different, uh, actually, a structural challenges and then for, for floating platforms, for example. But it's a good opportunity for decarbonizing, for example, the oil and gas activity uh, there. Uh, about the uh, ocean thermal energy has a great potential along the coastline when we talk, when we see from uh, southeast to north and northeast of the Brazil. Uh, to have a technical, technically feasible, uh, actually, production of ocean thermal gradient, we need a, a difference, thermal difference between the uh, surface of the water and the actually deep water about 20, uh, uh, 20 um, ce uh, Celsius uh, degree. So we can observe that along the Brazilian coastline, we have. Uh, in all, all along the Brazilian coastline, we have this 20 uh, degree of difference. So it's possible to uh, take advantage of this uh, huge potential that we have here. And about the wave energy as well, we have very good uh, wave energy when we, we can see in, in, in south, southeast, northeast, and north of the Brazil. So we have really good potential in terms of these, especially these three sources that I've already showed here. So uh, this is the this is the uh, um, study about the complementarity of, uh, between offshore wind and hydropower, and uh, actually with the participation of the uh, researcher from the actually uh, tech, um, aeronautic uh, technological university institution in Brazil. So we we can see the good. Uh, complementarity be between north is offshore wind and these basins that you can see that is mark highlighted along the Brazil. So uh, the results uh, show that we can actually uh, have this uh, complementarity if, if we establish a really good strategy to how to take advantage of this, this characteristic in Brazil. Uh, this is the complementarity study between offshore solar and offshore wind as well. We can see uh, this is the hourly actually uh, complementarity of the offshore wind and solar. 
we can see that during the day we have uh, we can reach up to 30 30 40 percent of complementarity this is really important in in some some process like hydrogen production when we need actually to attenuate the intermittency of the of the offshore wind or or solar so this complementarity can be interesting in such a specific process as well okay and we did some studies about the uh, applying different environmental issues and technical issues and talking a little bit about the levelized cost of energy of offshore wind uh, so this is this is the first map we put here actually um all the available data about the environmental parameters along the coastline. Uh, so uh, these are the areas that, uh, these are the parameters that we need to take care, we need to monitor when we want to actually install any uh, uh, offshore renewable projects. Uh, we can observe a good uh, actually uh, synergy and between the oil and gas activities here, especially in Southeast, and the offshore wind uh, uh, for the decarbonizing the oil and gas actually uh, industry. And this is another study applied in the southeast of Brazil, applying the technical actually consideration. For example, we excluded the area with more than 100,000 dip. We excluded the area with the average velocity smaller than seven meters per second. We excluded the marine protected areas. We excluded uh, uh, the uh, distance of uh, 15 kilometers from the coast because of the uh, visual impacts. And uh, based on this, we calculate the available technical potential of offshore wind along the southeast and uh, very, very good numbers that we, we obtained. And we can see this is, uh, this is different, actually, a uh, modeling, global model that we applied. But the first one can show that you can see that uh, very good uh, actually wind resources here where we have intense uh, oil and gas activities as well in the here in, in Basin uh, Santos. And uh, this is a actually a levelized cost of energy of offshore wind in southeast of Brazil. We can see the values here uh, in uh, around the Cabo Frio, uh, along, uh, near to the Asu port, we can see the values uh, lower than the global average. So this is because the high capacity factor of the wind that we have in this region and because of the proximity of the offshore wind to the coast. So in this region, applying a high resolution uh, regional model to actually analyzing the wind velocities, we obtain these values for the levelized cost of energy that are really interesting when we compare to the other regions around the world, right? Okay, talking about the marine energy, we have um, uh, these two wave energy projects. First, uh, first, uh, wave energy project that was installed in 2012 in Sierra, Porto do Pesing. And the second one, it was an onshore wave project. And the second one, which is a near shore wave project that uh, we plan to actually, uh, I hope that we could install it in <laughs> Rio de Janeiro. But uh, let's see each one. This is the first project. Uh, actually, we have two buoys here. Uh, uh, going up and down vertically, and these uh, two boys actually uh, start to uh, driving a hydraulic PTO system that have a capacity, installed capacity 100 kilowatts, right? And it was installed in 2012. It was a full scale prototype. It was the first one in Latin America, one of the, one of the pioneers uh, in, in the world in that time. And we actually achieved the TRL, the technology readiness level of six. Uh, and um, it was decommissioned after one year of operation because of some, some construction in the Pesin port. 
different publications from this project, but I, I put here two of these publications that just, just to show two example. And the second project is the wave energy project. It's not a onshore wave energy project, it's a near shore because it's, it's, it was supposed to be installed and it was planned to be installed near to Ilia Haza that we have establishment of the Marine of Brazil. And uh, it has an install capacity of 40 kilowatt, distance of four, uh, five, uh, 14 kilometers from the Copacabana beach and in a water depth of 25 meters. So we achieved the TRL of four and we are actually planning some some uh, tests in the medium scale test in Labo Oceano for this year for this uh, wave energy project. The difference is, as you can see, that the system is smaller, so we try to reduce the cost and we apply the specific control system to actually increase the production. So reducing the cost, increasing the production, trying to uh, trying to approximate to commercialization to be economically be viable such a system, right? And these are three examples of the publication from this project. Uh, I'm showing this publication because it's important when we talk about research and development. So we, we, we show our results like in publication, in journals, to show that what we are doing and what are the results that we have. Some initial, actually, activities about the other two resources, the ocean thermal energy plant. Each plant can reach up to 100 megawatt of installed capacity. It's a huge capacity and uh, but different uh, structural uh, uh, challenges are involved. So we are focused at this initial stage on the sizing, dimensioning of the structural components and actually optimization of the power production considering the resource characteristic, which is specific for any region. For example, here in the northeast of Brazil, we can reach that 20 uh, degree of difference between this surface and the water uh, uh, dip in 500 meter water depth, while in, around the world you can see it in 1,000 water depth. So 1,000 water depth, just uh, thinking about the tube of the, with the diameter of 10 meters and one kilometer uh, uh, inside the water. So when, you, when we have 500 meters of distance, it's uh, it's facilitate our our uh, structural actually challenges. So this is a characteristic of Brazil and an uh, ocean current actually uh, systems that we are uh, taking advantage our, of CFD analysis of wind turbine that we have uh, to apply the CFD analysis on the actually rotor of the ocean current and using actually fluid structure interaction techniques using CFD and finite element methods to understand uh, the actual structural responses of each blade because we know that there are huge blades and the water currents with the high velocity so high we are talking about the really high uh, structural loads right so this is a very important issue right let's uh, move forward to offshore wind um, I just put here the subject that we are working right now. Uh, we are working on wind farm layout optimization, uh, wake effect of turbines that is really important in the planning stage of each project for offshore wind. Uh, estimation of power production, hydrodynamic behavior of the floating system, of course, it's really important. A structural analysis that is after having the couple analysis and hydrodynamic analysis and know the loads you do you can do the structure analysis mooring analysis is really important when we talk about the deep and ultra deep waters of course and the platform material so uh, this is some 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 pictures some images from our works here we can see the blades for example applying the fsi fluid stru structure interaction using the cfd method and finite element method to understand the uh, actually behavior of such a long a structural components. We are talking about the 120 meters of, of each blade. So, and the very high 
a structural load from wind. So it's, it's, it needs its sophisticated analysis to understand the behavior and know the actually uh, the behavior along the lifetime, okay? And we have the wake analysis that we use for the layout optimization of offshore wind. It's, we are if you see the reports, we have different actually uh, numbers. In Europe, you can use this 5D. D is the diameter of the rotor. United States, 7D. Another place is 10D. What's going to be in, in Brazil? What's going to be in South Seas? In Rio de Janeiro is different because they have different wind characteristics. So uh, we have different uh, turbulence intensity. Based on this, we need to analyze the wake effect to understand what's going to be the uh, distance between each wind turbine. So we need, it, this is local dependent. We need to see the local and do this analysis. This is what we are doing here. So this is the coupled uh, analysis of floating uh, structure, considering the aerodynamic, the hydrodynamic, the structural loads, the control loads that, if, uh, that affect all this uh, behavior and estimating the power production. Uh, another interesting subject is a material that we use for the platforms. Normally, uh, it's, 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 it's common to use steel uh, for the platforms, but we, are, we, we can see the uh, concrete materials nowadays. Uh, it's more, more, uh, more projects with concrete. So this is, the, this is our interest in, in uh, analyzing the in comparative study between two materials for the platform, floating platforms. And finally, the mooring, which is very important here when we talk about the offshore wind in deep and ultra deep waters, more than 1,000 meters of water depth, when we talk about the decarbonizing the oil and gas activities, for example. Uh, this is the topic that we are studying, and actually optimization of mooring system using, in this case, a genetic algorithm. And the final subject that uh, we are working on is hydrogen production from offshore wind. So uh, objectively, we are developing an algorithm to calculate the hydrogen production and levelize cost of hydrogen, hydrogen from offshore wind. Um, actually, this project uh, considers two scenarios, hydrogen production onshore and hydrogen production offshore. Right, so uh, one of the objective is to have a special distribution of the hydrogen production uh, and the level of cost of cost of hydrogen along the, for example, south is on the south north east of Brazil. How the levelized cost of hydrogen change when we change the distance from shore, when we change the material, when we change the all detail of this component that is it's, it's something complex to consider. Uh, we are developing a real-time simulation of hydrogen production from offshore wind. It means that you consider all the detailed dynamic of electrolyzer, desalinator, offshore wind, uh, wind intermittency, everything. So everything is included into this algorithm. Consideration of power control strategies using uh, battery sizing. This is a very important issue. Electrolyzer control and the balance of plants of the electrolyzer. Of course, desalinator, compressor, storage, and transport are included. And this is the algorithm. It's not specific. In this case, we are doing for offshore wind, but uh, it's not limited to offshore wind. It's applicable uh, to any local and any renewable source of energy that we have. So. This is the uh, this is what we are doing uh, to do this. Actually, of course, this is a multidisciplinary subject. We are working in a multidisciplinary uh, actually a group. It's a, it's a project coordinated by Jero. Uh, however, we are working. We are from ocean engineering. We are working with uh, researchers from meteorology department, from electrical engineering department, from metallurgical and materials that is in charge of electrolyzer stuff. We are working with mechanical engineering that doing the optimization and energy planning uh, researchers that actually uh, developing the cost estimation process, right? So uh, just to have an idea what we are talking about, 
These are two scenarios that we are working on. Uh, the first one is onshore production of hydrogen. It means that you produce electricity, but by offshore wind, in this case, we consider a fixed uh, structures. And then you uh, actually, there is a sub offshore substation that collect the energy, and then in the, in the onshore case, then transmit to the shore. Then you have the desalination, electrolyzer, compressor, a temporary and temporarily uh, a storage system that we call the tank and then hydrogen right this is the onshore production and offshore production it works like this we have wind turbine producing electricity substation to collect in, uh, energy and then we have desalination electrolyzer compressor and tank all offshore and then we can transport actually this hydrogen via pipeline to the cost. So these are two scenarios that we are considering that we are working on. And to understand the more detail about the, about the, actually the algorithm, this is, this is a flow chart. This is the, a flow chart of the algorithm. We have one input. It's a wind data. Because of this, I said that it can be applied in any source of energy. This can be solar energy, any other source of energy. In this case, it's wind data. In this wind data, we have the box for uh, actually doing a layout optimization of the wind park for calculating the power production. And then we have a power control to actually manage the produced power, how to distribute the power to the electrolyzer, to the desalinator, compressor, and different components that has electrical consumption, right? Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, fundamental part of the project. Okay, if we have onshore production, we transmit the electricity to the shore. If not, we actually power control, we have electrolyzer, desalinator, hydrogen and oxygen, and then storage and transport, right? For offshore production uh, and for onshore production, we have the storage, but for onshore, we don't have transport, of course. So then uh, applying this, flowchart, of course, each box has a really detailed mathematical uh, process involved. And then we can have the levelized cost of hydrogen and actually a process optimization with the objective of reducing the cost to see what components are sensitive, are important to uh, have a cost reduction in, in this process. Okay, this was what I had for today, for you, and uh, I think Sejin, the next presentation, I think is, uh, let me check here, I just, from Bruce, okay. So I will, I would like to invite Bruce Cameron <laughs> for the next presentation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you for coming out and uh, uh, supporting uh, what we consider to be a very important initiative uh, through the Pan American Marine Energy Association uh, in, in collaboration with uh, our, our members in, uh, in Brazil. Um, as, I, as I noted earlier, the PAMIC is, is part of an international research uh, series of conferences, and we're very pleased that Brazil is, uh, uh, is, is starting to participate very strongly. And uh, this is a great opportunity to actually bring a perspective uh, of the Americas into what is happening. <clears throat> the excellent presentation by Malad showing uh, what's going on in Brazil just means that for the purposes of this conversation, Brazil is not up there. We've just discussed what Brazil is, uh, is doing. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, a bit of an overview of some of the other areas of uh, activity uh, that have been going on. Uh, no, that's not, there we go, uh, in, in the Americas. 
But I want to first of all start off with a with a global context because it's it's very important to understand where everything is going in the decarbonization and the electrification agenda. Uh, and it really is a policy choice between central power systems and distributed systems. Uh, and, and people who like to plan like pow central power systems. People who like uh, users to have control like distributed power systems. And how the new balance will come out is a very important issue that, uh, that needs to be addressed for proper planning on decarbonization. And who will own the new systems and who will make the investments? The pace of change is much more rapid than any, uh, anyone who's been generally involved in energy planning, uh, where a decade is a, is a short time. Uh, and now we're facing worlds where uh, months and even uh, just a few years can change things radically. Um, I just think about the difference in offshore wind focus and hydrogen a year ago was quite different than it is today. So it just gives you a sense of how rapidly uh, global events can affect uh, energy uh, issues and systems. Um, all of this is also connected with, in those policy decisions, all sorts of environmental commitments. So that's what's driving a lot of this, environmental climate change. Uh, because we still can get less expensive electricity if we use petroleum, uh, but we're not going to use petroleum forever. We're going to uh, make a transition, and therefore the drive and the pace of change on that is affected. Social commitments. Uh, various uh, provinces and states around the world are making very important social commitments which drive their policy decisions. And, indigenous people and just transition for petroleum workers is a very common theme uh, when you're looking at, uh, at policy change. And economic development opportunities is, is a very important driver, but there's a balance there. And that is how do you uh, value the importance of jobs versus the lowest cost of electricity. The context for marine renewables is that it can serve both ends and all of the agendas. Central power systems such as large offshore wind uh, are part of that rapid decarbonization of the grid and the movement for more electricity in the future. But distributed energy resources can foster uh, electrification and development and decarbonization in many remote communities. And so we, we look at holistically how valuable a role marine energy can play in the future of our energy systems. And PAMEC supports dialogue with researchers, government and industry on events like this. Earlier this year in January, we had a, a, a very good uh, conversation with researchers and government and some industry in Bogota, in Colombia, looking at what's going on. So this is, the, this is one of the ways that, that connecting all of the uh, people in the Americas that we can foster this growth in collaboration and also knowledge. So let me just get, go through the regional overview. It's a necessity, high level and, and, and short, um, but it gives you a sense of flavor and I will try and comment a little bit on the flavor of, of each of the jurisdictions where we're seeing a lot of activity through our association. Uh, Chile is, is a very interesting uh, member of, uh, of, of PAMIC. Um, from a policy point of view, energy policy, uh, Chile has been for quite some time uh, a free market, let the lowest cost prevail and whatever it may be. Uh, and really, uh, that has impacted things in a, in a major way. This, this shows a, a solar PV installation, which was uh, the RFP was give us the lowest cost technology that can serve the market between uh, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. <laughs> so that was a, a little bit of a nudge to, to solar. But nevertheless, it came in at a phenomenally low cost, well below 10 cents. Uh, and this is like... Uh, 10 years ago. 
However, when they start looking out from a regional development lens in the southern part of Chile, there is a nudge for economic development reasons and a series of uh, supportive uh, projects at a smaller scale. And, and really, we're seeing in, in many parts of Chile under the auspices of their uh, research center, Merrick, uh, connecting to a whole series of different kinds of smaller scale technologies. So even if, even in this brutal world of may the lowest cost win, a few flowers are, are blooming uh, and uh, they are having uh, some very interesting experiments and, and, and pilots in the smaller scale. And desalinization is a very interesting uh, piece of technology that, that can come from marine renewables to great benefit, particularly in remote situations. In Colombia, it's really exciting what, what is happening there because they have, uh, they're using their national petroleum company and the national uh, experience in a, a highly uh, decarbonized grid today to prepare for the, for the future. And it's, it's interesting that when you talk about where they need to go, where they want to go, they're looking at three times the amount of electricity that it produced today. One part of the growth is coming from electrification. They need to change transportation. They need to change how they, uh, uh, the, the gas net networks need to be replaced by electrification. But the other part is hydrogen. They need to double the amount of electricity they have today in order to serve their hydrogen exports ambitions. And, and what we're seeing is across the world, as people start factoring in electrification and uh, other forms of, of energy and the role that electricity needs to play and even the hard to decarbonize areas using hydrogen, there's a massive growth in electricity needs. Uh, and, and my experience in Canada is that almost nobody wants to talk about that. Is that, that the utilities uh, don't want to frighten everybody, I guess. Anyway, it, the point is that there's a, going to be a, an awful lot of electricity that's going to be required and produced and very much we're looking at, at at offshore wind is going to be a, a major contributor to that in Colombia and elsewhere. Uh, when you look at that 109 uh, gigawatt uh, capacity for offshore wind, uh, that's what's driving a lot of interest in Colombia. Uh, they're looking at salinity gradient uh, near Barranquilla as a, as a pilot. But even when you talk about uh, offshore wind, uh, you need to be in many jurisdictions very sensitive to the people who were, who were there before the Europeans came. And uh, that is a major issue and a problem and a public policy issue that needs to be discussed and, and solutions found uh, in order to achieve all of those resource opportunities and, and benefits that will come. In Costa Rica, um, very much hydroelectricity, but it's now finding this electrification agenda. I don't think they have ambitions for hydrogen at this point, but they certainly do have uh, a very strong objective for electrification and decarbonization uh, in the transportation systems. And they'll need more electricity, and yet they probably can't build more hydroelectricity. Social acceptance is just not there. So instead, they're turning to uh, opportunities for offshore wind uh, and particularly floating uh, as they go out into deeper waters on, on Costa Rica with a 14 gigawatt capacity. A small country, uh, but very much uh, lives by a belief of sustainability. And so what they will be doing uh, is very important. And, and that's why we had the first PAMIC in, uh, in San Jose uh, in 2020. In Mexico, here's where policy uh, changes everything. Um, renewables have now been downgraded. 
uh, as a uh, as a priority in uh, in Mexico, and uh, the the president has has decided uh, that uh, hydrocarbons will be supported, uh, and renewables not so much. Uh, and what had been a robust uh, academic uh, research agenda in Mexico is is now not as strong uh, as it as it has been, but it's still still going. Uh, and there's a, a, a good amount of research that you would recognize uh, in your universities here, a resource assessment, um, small small scale demonstration projects, and so on and so forth. But on the current agenda, offshore wind, uh, floating or otherwise, is, is not on the agenda. Uh, nevertheless, our second PAMIC was uh, in June of last year uh, and a great success. In the USA, um, there, there has been an accelerated emphasis on renewables in the United States under the Biden presidency. Uh, they've been going strong for some time at a micro scale of looking at and investing in marine renewables, uh, tidal, wave, and so on. Um, it was originally designed for those micro kinds of situations where uh, it was just not feasible to have a petroleum solution. Um, it was originally a pure energy policy, now part of the blue economy. Uh, and what does that mean? They, they have uh, 39 gigawatts of policy commitments in offshore wind today. That's through licensing rounds and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the most active area is on the Atlantic side, uh, where there's vast amounts of investments and European companies very much engaged in, in starting to develop offshore wind in the uh, eastern seaboard of the United States in a very strong way. But it's now licensing moving into the Gulf of Mexico uh, and, and off the west coast floating offshore wind licensing rounds uh, are, are well on their way. Um, in, in, in essence, we're, we're looking at a, a late player uh, but once the U.S. gets into the game, uh, they become a major player. Um, oops. Oh, sorry. This is a, there was a, there was another slide I added to, to the presentation. I just want to note that last week the U.S. issued its own offshore wind policy, and in that in that policy announcement, it talked about cost reductions that are if to, if they are achieved make a huge difference in, uh, in global uh, energy uh, assumptions about the cost of, of marine renewables. They're, they're talking about being able to reach, uh, I believe it's $51 a megawatt for floating offshore wind uh, by the, uh, in the early 30s. Uh, that's not very long from now, and that's a very attractive price. They're also talking about uh, massive increase in the amount of that, even that 39 goes way up. So again, they've got the policy, they've got the investment, they've got the, the wherewithal to uh, essentially drive what we understand is economically feasible uh, in our hemisphere and, and the world. In terms of Canada, <clears throat> we've had uh, strong support for Tidal for quite some time. It's driven by, as Laura spoke to us uh, from her car earlier, it's uh, driven a lot by the resource potential in the Bay of Fundy, where in uh, our, our classic saying is that more water goes in and out of the Bay of Fundy uh, every day, uh, more than the, all the world's rivers. And so when you, when you think of Brazil and the, uh, and, and the rivers here, we've got, we've got a bay where it's having that kind of volume of water changing in, in the highest tides in the world, but it's some of the strongest currents. And, and it's been a very strong priority uh, for the province of Nova Scotia, which is on half of the Bay of Fundy. And it's also uh, had a lot of industry activity over the, over the years. Um, and when you come to these matters, uh, it's always important to, to note that it doesn't matter about the resource, the technology, uh, even the, the, the political commitments. 
you have to make sure that you can also meet the demands of, uh, of the regulators who are concerned about uh, environmental fishing, existing users, species at risk, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and we're going through a period of time right now to be able to assess the proper level uh, of precaution that is necessary, and it's not an easy, uh, and not an easy task. Um, but this is part of the holistic uh, perspective when you're looking at uh, coming into a marine environment with uh, different places, uh, different kinds of, uh, of risks, and how you assess them. Uh, Canada is really rich in more than the Bay of Fundy. Bay of Fundy being down there on the on the bottom uh, right. Uh, there's many other opportunities in Canada and very good opportunities with remote communities and off-grid solutions. Uh, and so for that, that reason, uh, there's a lot of attention that's still going on in wave and tidal. I'm not going to talk about offshore wind in Canada because uh, Lisa's going to come back in a moment and she's going to speak to, to that. Uh, more directly from Marine Renewables Canada perspective, but just before I turn it back over to her, um, I, I do want to note that yeah, the next PAMIC is in Barranquilla in uh, Colombia uh, in, uh, in January of next year. And one of the things that I've been doing here for the past uh, day or so has been uh, speaking to people at this university, encouraging them to uh, submit uh, extended abstracts. Uh, to the uh, to the conference and and the the system, uh, and encourage those of you who are in the position of doing research in the area to consider uh, submitting an, an extended abstract. Uh, the uh, The official extended abstract uh, session will be open soon uh, and close in uh, in June. Uh, so, all of your thinking and all of your work in marine renewables, uh, think about. Uh, doing it for the PAMIC conference uh, coming up uh, in uh, January of, uh, of next year. Thank you very much. There we go. All right. Um, hi, back again, everyone. So I'll be uh, discussing basically just offshore wind, um, the opportunity in Canada from our perspective, and uh, sort of what Canada has been doing to support offshore wind development. Um, just to, to start, so Canada has a really great offshore wind opportunity, um, like Brazil, great wind speeds, supportive policy, um, so I'll just go into a few of these now. So we similarly have a sort of federal and provincial um, levels of government. On the federal level, um, we have a energy sort of framework that's come out uh, recently in 2019. Uh, we have the Canadian Energy Regulator Act that was passed, uh, that was enacted. Um, and that's establishing a regulator essentially for offshore renewable energy, which will include offshore wind. We'll have some regulations coming out shortly that will address sort of operations and safety um, and environmental impacts. Um, around this time last year, it was announced that our former um, offshore petroleum boards, which are joint management regimes with the federal and provincial governments of two of our provinces, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Um, so those formerly offshore petroleum regulator boards will now be expanding to regulate offshore energy generally. So that means uh, offshore wind as well. We'll have a clear regulator, which um, is very important um, to have clarity in that respect. Um, in terms of investment and other and other dimensions, we need clear regulations for, for these industries. Um, other developments recently in terms of supportive policy in Canada, we have a regional assessment that is again a, a federal um, initiative. The Impact Assessment Agency of Canada is conducting it. 
And essentially what they're looking at is they do a large scale impact assessment, um, essentially environmental impact assessment where um, offshore wind might be developed. So they're looking at areas off the coast of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Um, so that's a very promising development and it sets the stage for project specific um, environmental impact assessments down the road once developers are at that stage and looking at putting offshore wind into the water. So that's a process that was kicked off actually this month in Canada and they have 18 months to complete the process. So um, we're looking at having that regional assessment complete by uh, next September, it should be. Um, and then lastly, in terms of supportive policy, while we don't have a federal target for offshore wind development, one of our provinces in Nova Scotia um, has established a five gigawatt target. Um, so they'll be trying to begin leases for five gigawatts of offshore uh, wind energy by 2025. Um, so that's a really exciting development and that's really kickstarted a lot of um, great policy initiatives uh, and legislative development in Canada. Um, like everywhere else, we need, Canada needs clean electricity um, and offshore wind is a great opportunity to uh, insert reliability uh, into the grid. So as we decarbonize and electrify uh, more and more, we need more energy um, uh, to the grid. So as Bruce was mentioning with Columbia, they'll need about three times more energy, possibly more if you factor in uh, hydrogen export. Uh, Canada is looking at the same situation where we need approximately three times more energy than we currently uh, produce to meet our energy demand. So um, the more renewable energy, the better and uh, our offshore wind potential and our resource potential in Canada luckily is very good. Um, this is the sort of third uh, third square on the screen here. It shows it's a it's a map we're probably all familiar with at this point, but essentially the more purple that you see is the higher mean wind speeds. Um, so this is a map created by Ager Insights. Um, so Canada's got a great resource potential. Um, we've got some wind speeds around 10.5 um, meters per second there. Um, and uh, so it's a very good potential resource. We've got wind speeds that rival the, those of the North Sea, which we know is a very prolific offshore wind area. And Nova Scotia alone, the province has a technical resource potential of about 935 gigawatts. So really great potential. Um, we have our seabed is is compatible with both fixed and floating technologies. So uh, there's an area off of Nova Scotia called Sable Island, um, which has great shallow water, um, which would be good for fixed uh, offshore wind. And that's an area that's historically been um, very, very productive for offshore oil and, oil and gas. So there's some infrastructure and some lessons learned there that we can take forward as we develop offshore wind. Um, Newfoundland as well, great resource potential there. Um, that's another area in Canada where they're doing a regional assessment for offshore wind. Um, they're right now focused on developing in terms of renewables. It's more of an onshore wind focus at the moment, um, but they're definitely looking at uh, offshore wind as well and a lot of uh, great resource there. And then on the other side of Canada, on the West Coast, um, their renewable scheme is pretty good. They're very, uh, BC is very hydro focused at the moment, but like everywhere else, energy demand is increasing uh, with decarbonization and electrification. So they're starting to open up as well and, and very interested in offshore wind development. Um, and then finally, in terms of our opportunity in Canada, we've got an amazing experienced supply chain. Um, all Many of our companies on the coast, uh, coastal provinces have extensive experience and a long history with, uh, with maritime industry offshore oil and gas, um, very, very easily transmittable skills in those departments. Um, and in fact, many of our ports are very well positioned to be servicing the offshore wind industry. Some of them are already um, concluding contracts with for the US offshore wind industry. Um, we've got one port in Newfoundland, the port of Argentia, that's a member of ours that um, is become North America's first monopile marshalling port. So they're undergoing construction 
to uh, to get to get going on on marshalling, and then as well the port of Sydney uh, in Cape Breton um, is uh, making the necessary improvements to set up set themselves up for for servicing offshore wind. In terms of Atlantic Canada and what what the plan for offshore wind energy is, um, obviously we want clean electricity to the grid. Um, there are of course some challenges like everywhere else with transmission. Canada is a very large country, so transmitting from the east to the west coast efficiently is difficult to do. But um, luckily, there's lots of uh, energy that's being put into figuring that out, as well as transmitting to the U.S. Um, there's solutions being developed. But in terms of this first five gigawatts that um, Nova Scotia has, has, has as a target to lease uh, in 2025, this is primarily the focus for this will be green hydrogen production and export. So um, right now we have two hydrogen facilities uh, in Nova Scotia that are being proposed. One has received a preliminary approval, uh, both proposed by, my, by members of, of Marine Renewables Canada. So very exciting progress on the green hydrogen front. Um, we have a Germany-Canada hydrogen alliance that's really driving that as well. Um, so we've committed to begin exporting hydrogen, green hydrogen to Germany by 2025. Um, so for this initial five gigawatts, we're really looking at, at green hydrogen. And then ultimately, um, you know, we'd love to see uh, heavy industries like shipping, transportation and, and different industries like that um, electrify via offshore wind. And, and, we, and we definitely feel like the potential is there. I've talked about these policy um, initiatives that are happening in Canada. We have a great regulatory framework that's being developed. We have some legislative amendments that are going to take into account offshore wind, the regional assessment, and uh, a five gigawatt target in Nova Scotia for leasing. Um, you know, obviously industry and ourselves always want things to go faster and more efficiently, but what this timeline shows is really that um, things have been happening, um, especially in the last few years, and, and Canada's really taking the steps necessary um, to, to, to make offshore wind a reality. Um, this is just an overview. Uh, Bruce talked about, um, I won't go into depth about this, Bruce talked about a lot of our, you know, tidal, wave, and river energy um, potential and, and development. This just kind of shows across our country the different projects that are that are either proposed or ongoing. Um, the Bay of Fundy, obviously great for tidal. And then we've got offshore wind proposed on both um, coasts uh, of, our, of our country. On the west coast uh, of Canada off of BC, we've got similar to the US, a straight sort of drop off um, in terms of our coastline. So floating, wind, floating offshore wind will be huge on the west coast, but we do have some shallow areas. Um, and one of our members has an investigative use license in BC for a 17 gigawatt project um, that would be both floating and fixed. So we're gonna see both of those technologies developed on both of our coasts, which is exciting. Um, and then briefly, I'll just discuss sort of what Marine Renewables Canada or our organization has been doing to promote the growth of offshore wind in Canada. Um, so we advocate heavily for policy development. Um, so there's been different regulatory processes going on in Canada to really upgrade our laws and our regulations to ensure that offshore wind happens smoothly and to, to make you know, a very clear regulatory scheme, which helps attract investment, of course, and makes everything easier. So um, our Department of Fisheries and Oceans has, you know, opened up their regulatory regime for consultation and for improvement through a federal process called the Blue Economy Regulatory Review. Um, and we've been very active in advocating for um, clear policy, clear regulations um, through processes like that. Then um, we offer offshore wind working groups. We have working groups amongst our members in both the tidal and offshore wind uh, sectors. So those working groups bring together developers of offshore wind for that working group in particular to talk about common problems, priority areas, um, and really to get the, the minds together um, to create solutions and to drive the industry forward. Um, so those have been really, really productive. Um, we also, right now, where Canada is in terms of offshore wind, 
basically most people just have a lot of questions. What is it going to look like? What's going to be involved? How long of a timeline are we looking at until turbines are in the water? So we've, as an organization, Marine Renewables Canada has been focusing on public education and stakeholder engagement. Um, so just getting the information out there, providing offshore wind 101 workshops to stakeholders like fisheries organizations, for example, and working with indigenous groups as well um, to ensure that these projects are moving forward in, in a good way. Um, and then lastly, in terms of our activities on uh, on offshore wind, we do supply chain development. So we're bringing members together, fostering connections through our events, um, online webinars, uh, virtual networking opportunities, just really building um, knowledge about who's doing what in the industry to make sure that, uh, that, that things can move forward efficiently. Um, and then finally, one of the things that we do and, and, and why we're, we're so happy to be here today is, is looking at opportunities for um, international collaboration. So um, like, like this event today, like this workshop. So, you know, sharing best, best practices and lessons learned amongst countries is really important. While offshore wind is new in Canada, it's not new elsewhere. You know, it's been going on in Europe for a long time. I think the first... Um, offshore wind turbine was in the water in 1991. So there's a lot that we can learn from other jurisdictions and we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. So so, so finding ways to, to transfer that knowledge is key. Um, supply chain connections and partnerships. So there's so much potential. Um, and I think Bruce will may address this later, but you know, especially between Brazil and Canada, there's ex great existing relationships and, and good trade relations already. So the more we can capitalize on that and, and get our companies talking together, I think the faster we're going to be able to develop um, both of our offshore wind industries in Canada and Brazil. Um, and in terms of Marine Renewables Canada, so we have an international business development plan that we put together. It's a three year plan. Um, we've put ours together this year for the next planning for the next three years. And Brazil is a huge focus of ours. We're going to be commissioning a Brazil mar a market study of Brazil's offshore wind um, potential and uh, this year. So we're very interested. We know there's great supportive policy going on um, and we really look forward to more opportunities to collaborate together. Um, and I'll throw it back to Bruce now, but just my contact information is, is up. Um, again, really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak about Canada's offshore wind potential and and uh, looking forward to more opportunities to collaborate in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lizen, for the presentation, for the nice presentation. So uh, for the next presentation, we have a representative from Brazilian Energy Office, uh, EPE, Empresa de Pesquisa Energética. Josina, por favor. Thank you. Thank you, Milad and the organization for the opportunity to be here presenting some of EP's publications regarding offshore wind and also hydrogen. Um, my name is Tina. I'm an energy research analyst in EP in the sector of uh, genera energy generation planning. So thank you, Mad. Uh, before I start, I will just to give some highlights about EPE. EPE is the Energy Research Office here in Brazil, and it's a public company, and uh, it's linked to the Minister of Mines and Energy. 
And the purpose of the company is to perform studies in order to uh, promote the uh, energy policy here in Brazil. So uh, offshore wind, it's a very relevant topic now, but it's uh, relatively uh, recent in the, off in the energy planning here in Brazil. The first uh, document where there was an effort to map the potential for offshore wind was a study uh, in the energy, the national energy planning plan. And then after that, offshore wind has been considered. Uh, every year we have many studies going on, uh, being published, as you can see in this timeline I brought here. But uh, today, because in this topics circulated here. I will start with the Brazilian Offshore Wind Roadmap. Uh, it was uh, made in a context where the uh, offshore wind was, was gaining relevance in an international scenario. And here in Brazil, uh, offshore wind, there was also some developers uh, going after the license in the environmental agents here. So we saw there was interest in also here in Brazil. And then we'll, EPE uh, made this document trying to better understand the, this resource and also identify some uh, potential challenges or barriers that we could face here for the development of offshore wind. With this in mind, uh, the document focus on offshore wind potential, uh, leg legal and regulatory aspects, technological aspects, costs, environmental aspects, grid connection. And here I brought uh, the example of the potential. It's a theoretical potential, like Milad explained the differences. So uh, in the documents, considering only water depths of up to 50 meters, uh, we we found almost 700 gigawatt uh, of potential. So for fixed uh, foundations, okay, for floating would be even uh, higher, much higher. And we have addressed some, uh, we have found some uh, challenge in the document. We address some possible activities like we have a uh, challenge regarding the competitiveness of the source, regarding the transmission system expansion assessment or port infrastructure that we um, maybe adapt for the source and many other, uh, other aspects. The document is available in EP's website in Portuguese. There is no English version, but there is an interactive page where you can see uh, like a summary uh, of this, this publication also in English. And now I will talk about the, our middle, middle term plan, the PDE, it's the 10 year uh, expansion plan and how we consider offshore wind. So uh, the EPE is a document which is pub uh, published annually and prepared by EPE under the guidelines from the uh, Ministry of Mines and Energy. And it indicates the perspectives for the expansion of the energy system uh, in a horizon of 10 years. Here is just an example for the PD 2031. Here uh, we have the electrical energy matrix in the year of 2021. The share of uh, renewable energy is the highest, uh, mostly from hydropower. And uh, on the right, you can see the projected uh, system in the year of 2031. Uh, will be less, uh, uh, small, smaller share of the hydro but a uh, bigger share of other renewable source, so we will remain renewable according to, to these perspectives. And what about offshore wind? How do we consider and 
uh, give the inputs for our models to modeling the offshore wind. So uh, regarding the energy production, we used Aero 5 uh, wind, wind speed data. And we used a, a typical turbine for offshore wind. We update each year, but uh, for this uh, it PGE specifically, we use a 12 megawatt turbine, but uh, of course we we update when the technology uh, get bigger or with higher capacities. So uh, for for example, here we have chosen some locations with uh, good potentials in each region, and according to the projects that are submitting for the license in Ibama the environmental agents here in Brazil. And we came, for example, uh, the first figure is to, the first graph is to show the seasonality of the wind resource and the different regions. Uh, one thing it's common for all the regions is that in the second semester, you, you have the higher uh, generation. So that goes in complementarity with hydro power and the biggest ca capacity factors are in the northeast region. Here the, the second graph shows the hourly capacity factor. Just in the northeast, some wind farms we have simulated there. And uh, you can see there is uh, also a high variability during the day also for the generation. And about the costs that we give as input, we have studied uh, international references and considered many uncertainties and characteristics of Brazil. And then we came with uh, reference costs of roughly 10,000 Brazilian reais per kilo, kilowatt. And it, it's more than double the reference cost for the onshore wind, so it's still a, a high cost. But we have been seeing there is a, a trend, according to many studies, to the cost to decrease of the years. So it's also will be updated uh, when it it happens. But it is still uh, not competitive uh, for the models. And recently, we know there are many developers interested in developing offshore wind. So in Brazil, something that was uh, a challenge was the regulation. And last year, there was the publication of a decree, a de decreto in Portuguese, about the assignment of uh, areas and the use of the public uh, waters, the union waters, and also, two ordinance to uh, portarias in Portuguese, in Portuguese were published uh, in order to complement this decree. And, okay. I know. Milad? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So according to this regulation, there are two processes for the for use to access the area where a, a wind farm will be installed. The first one is the planet process. In, in this process, the government will be responsible for identifying the possible areas. Then the government will have to check if there is already some other area uh, in the same space, and also go ask for uh, the previous interference declaration uh, from other agencies or in other activities like um, for navigation or fishing, and see if there is no conflict. And then, if everything's okay, the government will select the prism for be tendering. And then there are two possibilities here. Uh, in the first possibility. Before tendering the, the area, the government will perform preliminary investigations to understand the, the resource better. 
and the environment constraints and everything and the potential for the, the generation. And then after that, the government will auction the area and the winner of the auction will try to obtain the granting and et cetera and, and build the wind farm. And the other option is that the government does not perform the potential study, but uh, the developer who wins the auction. There will be first the auction, then the developer will perform these preliminary investigations. And in the independent process, the main difference are in the beginning of the process that the identification of possible areas will be from the developer side. A developer will express an interest in for an area then the developer himself will go and check if there is interference with other possible activities. And if uh, it goes to, it's approved, it may, this area may be in an auction, may be auctioned, and then the process will be the same as the last one for the planet process. And uh, you may be asking, well, what EPE will do regarding this regulation. So we have some activities according to the regulations. Uh, I brought here for the first example, the independent process. Well, there will be these prisms that will be auctioned. They will have a limit for the size. They cannot be as bigger as they want. So this, this limit will be defined by the ministry but EPE will make some study to base this decision. And we are already working on that. Also, for the, the auction, the methodology for calculating the CBAD lease payment will be uh, defined, but EPE will be consulted for that. And also for the preliminary investigations, uh, EPE will need to to define some minimal requirements the developers will attend with these studies and also EPE will be responsible to receive these, these studies and also issue an opinion uh, in order to annul the regulatory agents, the electrical regulatory agents to approve these studies. In the for the planet process, also the same activities apply, but we have more activities. The identification of the areas will be responsibility of EPE. Also the verification uh, for interference with other activities uh, will be performed by EPE. And finally, the energy potential studies, the preliminary investigations will also be under the responsibility of EPE, we will have to perform these investigations. And of course, EPE already has some activities related to transmission expansion studies that uh, for every source that, that, that will continue to go for offshore wind and eventually some auction studies. And now I will move uh, for the next topic, it's also something that's gaining uh, high relevance. Recently, the low carbon hydrogen, there is a, a search of many countries are including low carbon hydrogen in their strategies for the energy generation and for the climate. And Brazil is one of those. And Brazil has a potential to be a supplier of low carbon hydrogen uh, internally and also to export. So EPE has published many documents about hydrogen production. Here are some examples. Some of those were made in cooperation with other countries like Germany and the, also the UK uh, partnership. And also in the 10 year plan, we have a chapter specific for hydrogen. It's very informative. And uh, there are information about the supply chain, the use of hydrogen, the potential, the costs, and also the opportunities for hydrogen production here in Brazil. And for the estimation of the potential, the technical potential for hydrogen 
from electrolysis from offshore wind was identified to be 350 megatons per year. It's a very high uh, potential. And I invite you to visit our website, IP website. There is an interactive tool, interactive tool, uh, where you can see the locations of the IND uh, projects, the potential for hydrogen production, and many information related to low carbon hydrogen. Also, the PGE, uh, the 10 year energy expansion plan, is available in English and in Portuguese in our website in the chapter 12. It's about hydrogen, it's very interesting. So to conclude, uh, like I, I told, the offshore wind and hydrogen have been considered in the energy planning sector and in EPE's studies. And Brazil has a huge natural environment for hydrogen production. And Brazil has the potential to be a key player in the hydrogen market. Competitiveness is a key challenge for the offshore wind in Brazil. And EPE uh, has an important role in this process according to the regulations published last year for the offshore wind energy assessment. And with this, I finish and thank you for the attention. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, Josina. I have one small question, quick question. Uh, if EP is looking at the marine renewable energy as well, like wave energy, current energy, if there's any movement inside EP about that? We studied this resource. We have a team always looking after that and the evolution we have been it's in our radar. Okay. Also. It's nice to hear that. Okay, so um, I'm asking if if uh, is there any question for the, the the speakers from first block? We have Bruce, Lizan, and Josina, and me. Hi, Josina. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's very important to know how EPE is seeing offshore wind market, especially for the the developer side, because we are preparing ourselves to attend this market. So. Sorry, my name is Fernanda. Uh, so uh, I have seen your presentation that you mentioned that the identification of the prisms to be carried out by EPE when we are talking about planned process, okay? So we know that we have just changed the government, but I'd like to understand if you are working to analyze some areas, how you are preparing yourselves. Are you moving ahead with this analysis? Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. Yes, we we expect for this first moment that the independent process will go first. Uh, so we are, of course, always studying and learn about the source and uh, having meetings with uh, international uh, experts to understand better how they perform this process. But right now we are focusing in this this first uh, activities assigned like to give a limit for the area and the cost studies, also which preliminary investigations will need to be applied. But of course, we, we have this in mind, but in this first moment, we believe that the independent process, since there are uh, seven projects in under the uh, IBAMA uh, website for the license, uh, so I, uh, we think that developers will manifest interest in for area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Yeah. Hi, Jacina, Adriano from Neo Energia. Uh, yeah, you talked in, in the, last, the last slide that competitiveness is the big challenge for offshore wind in Brazil. But could you speak a little bit about the transmission lines? Because uh, it's, it's a big challenge for Brazil. In Northeast Brazil, we have the, the huge potential, but it's very difficult to have a grid connection. Um, but here in this region, uh, the, the wind resource is not so good like Northeast, but the grid connection is easier than Northeast. So could you explain a little bit the challenge to plan the, the grid connection for offshore wind projects? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Adrian. As the grid transmission, it's a process that have been uh, going um, ahead of the, like 
EP has planned the construction, the expansion of the system even before there is the the project for operate there since onshore wind are building two two years or, or one year or less. So there is a proactivity uh, activity for expanding the transmission system. And uh, for offshore wind, also this will have to to happen, but uh, offshore wind takes a, a bigger time, a longer the time to be built. So this is, is good for trans transmission planning because there will be more time to expanding the transmission lines if there is the necessity uh, for that. Uh, but of course, there, there will be needs for expansion. And we have uh, probably not only in the northeast, but also in the southeast, uh, if there is wind farms here, uh, probably will be the need for expansion for the system. But the good thing is that the, since it takes a time, if there is an indication that uh, we will be built some new project, there is, there is a time for the transmission system to expand until there. Okay, thank you. Any other question, comments? If there is no comments, we are going to close the first block here and we have 20 minutes of coffee break. So I would like to invite everyone to for coffee break. Thank you.
Hello, hello. Tem como botar lá... É... Botar o pessoal, não? Pode chamar o pessoal? Está online? Ah, tá. Ok. Okay, let's uh, continue with the second block of the of the workshop. For the second block, we for the first presentation we have the Abe Eolica, which is the uh, Brazilian Association of Wind Energy. So I would like to invite Mateus, which is uh, who is representing Abe Eolica, for his presentation. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Wonderful. Hello, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank for the opportunity to be here uh, with you. Such a wonderful presentations we have this morning, right? So many scientific papers. I feel like I'm in, I'm in a, in a scientific playground for offshore wind, which is really interesting to see many insights and nice papers came from Milad, Bruce, Lizen, and Josina. So thanks for this amazing presentations. And now I'm here representing Abeolica today, and uh, we're gonna talk about, I'm sorry, I'm just getting news with this tool. Uh, we're going to talk about the opportunities and challenges for offshore wind energy uh, in Brazil. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Matheus Noronha. I'm head of offshore wind energy in Abeolica, the Brazilian Wind Energy Association. I'm also PhD in strategy innovation and postdoctorate from the university ASPM from Sao Paulo. So to start our presentation, is, uh, I would like to introduce what Abeolica is doing in the Brazilian context. Abeolica is the main Brazilian wind energy association. We was founded since 2002 and our mission is consolidate and promote the wind energy sector in Brazil. So uh, we help discussions and we receive contributions for onshore and offshore wind energy to promote the development of the source in Brazil. Okay, to start our presentation, uh, I would like to give you a, a briefly overview who's uh, part of uh, our association. So I'm seeing here so many familiar faces, um, our members, I'm seeing Prumo, I'm seeing Now Energia, also Equinor. All of these members are part of our association and they, they, and they help us in the discussions about regulatory framework, about the value chain, which is wonderful to have you here, guys, because I see all the engagement of offshore wind and that's what Abeolica is doing in the last, uh, last years. So 
to start uh, our presentation again, I would like to introduce you uh, some global data of onshore and offshore wind energy that I believe is really important to uh, put us in the same level of discussion. So, um, as you guys are seeing many news uh, in the press, uh, Bruce mentioned about uh, IRA. Uh, we've seen some investments about the European New Green Deal. All of them are looking for the ener energy transition as an opportunity to development. Uh, in this sense, we see offshore wind is really well positioned uh, for a discussion in this energy transition scenario. So I brought for you here uh, some news about the economist some news about the position of brazil china is leading the market so many interesting information about GWAC. last week um we had the opportunity to have here ben backwell which is the president of GWAC. he presented some of the main data of the sector which was uh incredible uh increasing in offshore winds uh, around the world but uh we have to um, go deep into the details here in our presentation. So start to start talking about the, um, the development of offshore wind around the world, I would like to uh, give you a quick look to this chart here. We've seen the development of the annual, uh, annual new capacity installed. If we look here between 2020 to 2021, uh, our um, new capacity installed uh, almost um, get in a Triple, uh, triple approach, jumping to 60.9 to 21.1 gigawatt. But uh, in the end of two, 2022, uh, we installed only 8.8 .8 gigawatts. Probably you guys gonna ask me why 8.8 .8 gigawatts? This is mainly because China stopped their government plans of installing. If we look here in 20 uh, in 2021, the data. I don't know if it's working really well, but I'll go like this. If you look in tw um, 2021, you can see the numbers uh, of 21.1 gigawatts. Uh, mainly China installed 15.5 gigawatts. So we have much to learn with China, UK. So these are relevant markets for the world. Uh, but when we look at the total installations in the world, we see that uh, we have as a capacity installed uh, of offshore wind energy 64 gigawatts, right? So we jumped uh, in the end of 2020 to 2022 to, uh, to uh, 36 uh, gigawatts to uh, uh, 64 gigawatts, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, looking at how is established this electric matrix, uh, the left side of your screen, you can check the new installations of onshore. Brazil is still, is still leading between the countries when we talk about onshore wind. Brazil was the third country which more ha have more installations around the world. So we installed around four gigawatts in the end of 2022. So it's a successful benchmarking when we talk about onshore wind energy. But when we go to the total installation, uh, we have um, some countries uh, in front of Brazil, like China, US, US, Germany, India, Spain, and also Brazil. Uh, Brazil is doing an excellent work in terms of installing onshore wind energy capacity, but we still have some challenges uh, to take and to approach in the, during this year of 2023. When we go to offshore wind, uh, we don't see Brazil yet, right? Especially because we're talking about regulatory framework. So Josina mentioned really well, uh, our, all our uh, regulatory structure that's being discussed nowadays. So that's why Brazil is not here between the countries that, that have new capacity installed and total capacity installed. But we have much to learn with these countries. We had the opportunity to make uh, technical missions. I'm here with Adriano, which is a big friend of us that were in uh, Washington DC last week in the IPF. We we had the opportunity to learn a lot about regulatory experience in US. Uh, that was amazing point. If you uh, look at this chart, uh, you don't see US uh, yet, but they have a really well, uh, a really nice work when we talk about regulatory framework. So they are preparing for the next years to achieve the goals that Bruce well mentioned here. So uh, when we go to uh, onshore winds, uh, when we go to onshore wind context, we have to talk about our Brazilian electric matrix because um, 
the onshore wind energy is the second source of our electric matrix. We have uh, 25.2 gigawatts with um, a, represent a representation of 13.2%. Our electric matrix is one of the main, um, more renewable metrics around the world. So we have 80% uh, of renewability in our uh, electric matrix. matrix. This is uh, such a good case for exploring hydrogen and other, um, uh, and other power to X insumes. So where is our capacity based in Brazil? Mainly in the northeast part from Brazil and also in a south part of Brazil. If you look here in the chat, you will find some states that are being established with onshore wind energy. We have right now 896 wind farms in commercial operation. So all of these farms uh, consolidate the wind park that we have right now in, in our country. Okay, I talk a little bit about the global context, onshore wind context, and now I'll go deep to the um, offshore wind energy uh, context in Brazil, what is being discussed, which is already mentioned by um, Jazina. Uh, so I'll, I won't go deep in all the details, but one good point that I would like to show is the good natural conditions from Brazil. So we have a good quality of wind located in the north part of Brazil, southeast in the south part of brazil this uh, this is where is based based our potential of wind here in our country when we go to offshore wind we have states that have the same potentials uh, potential in the same location when we look to rio grande do Norte, states from um the northeast area also in the southeast when we rio de janeiro and in the south, south part of our country close to rio grande do sul as well so these are uh, some studies that we already have in uh, uh, about offshore wind in, in Brazil. A uh, lot of studies. I could mention some others, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll go uh, in some details of these reports and start our conversation. Uh, I'll definitely have to talk about the roadmap, but Josina gave me a good warm up here. So I would like to talk about this specific study of uh, World Bank Group, which is called Going Global, Expanding Offshore into emerging markets. So that was the first study that we have for offshore wind in emerging markets. And when we talk uh, about Brazil, this study considers a potential of around 1.2 terawatts. This, was, this study was organized but by the World Bank. World Bank participates actively in our offshore working group in Abeolica. Uh, last week, we had opportunity to have meets in, meets with, meetings with them because they are helping us in the discussion of regulatory framework so this is re really relevant to show to you and then understand what is conducted by EPE, which is really well conducted, that they foresee a potential of around 700 gigawatts in places with deepest water uh, around 50 meters. So what I, wa I want to show you here is that we are discussing points, discussing reports that are consolidating Brazil in the scenario of offshore wind. And another document which is also important to mention here is the IBAMA, the, the term of reference from IBAMA. Okay, IBAMA set the main standards that we need to submit the projects. So I believe most part of you already saw the, the many gigawatts that we have submitted to, to IBAMA. Uh, that's why that's because they did uh, amazing work in terms of giving the directions for developers send contributions and submit their projects okay when we talk about Brazil, we have a really well uh, supply chain established when we talk about onshore wind energy. We have a capacity uh, of around 5.5 gig to produce 5.5 gigawatts per year. Uh, if you remind, in the first slides, I mentioned that Brazil, in the end of 2022, produced uh, 4 gigawatts. So uh, it lacks 1 gigawatt to make more production for Brazil. In between, this con uh, between these companies that are in our supply chain, we can find companies that already have experience in offshore wind. And they start talking about offshore wind and how they can transfer this knowledge for, uh, for the supply chain. Okay, jump into the next slide. So that's the, the map that I mentioned, um, mentioned for you. Uh, also, Josina mentioned here. If you check it out, the numbers, you will find that we have already 182 gigawatts submitted licensing process of, of IBAMA. You guys probably gonna ask me, um, 
is these projects, all of them will be developed? Uh, well, we need the regulatory structure to tell this for you guys. So uh, this is what Ibama made. So Ibama made a wonderful work. I would like to uh, congratulations all the their Ibama team. We know they are doing a uh, hard a hard work in terms of receiving all these projects, consolidating and organizing all of these projects in in our uh, in our structure, uh, and to show to the what Brazil has in terms of interesting of offshore wind. Okay, I spoke about the projects that are already submitted to Ibama. If we look here, uh, the these are the existing legal provisions that we are discussing right now. So uh, we have two pathways that we're talking about. Uh, one of them is the decree that is really well mentioned by Josina, and the other one is the bill. So both of them are being discussed. One by the Senate, and also and the, the other by the executive ministry. So Abiolica is working uh, on giving contributions for both legal disposition dispositions. We made a lot of meetings with the ministry. So that was a really uh, good work in terms of engage all stakeholders because the ministry went to Abiolica, they uh, listened to the investors, they participated in the discussions. So this is really uh, good because we are learning with experiences not only from Europe, but also from UK. Uh, in my perspective, uh, what Brazil uh, should do is try to learn with all the different approaches around the world, multi-criteria, price criteria, to try to establish the uh, regulatory framework that can promote competitiveness of the source. And I believe the our uh, main competent bodies are doing this. So um, it's a really uh, good work in terms of engagement of EPE, uh, IBAMA, and other institutions in Brazil. Uh, 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 also, I it's also I need, uh, which is really important as well, is this is the impact for offshore wind, a study created in 20 K government. So I have here some representatives that work in this study, Fernanda, which is with me and now is part of our team from Abeolica. So this study uh, main gives the, the directions for investors in Brazil when they want to start talking about offshore wind. So this is a really interesting study. We have uh, other documents that are supplementary that have information about the main stakeholders, about the, mm, the companies here in Brazil and different uh, outputs that was to the or ministry. This document helps in the construction of the decree and, uh, and what we have in terms of regulatory framework till now. So uh, the UK government is still helping chain studies. So this is another study that finds some gaps in our, um, in our value chain. These gaps uh, are mainly focused in transition parts, installation base, decommission, and reuse. The document uh, established the, the phase of the projects and highlights uh, what are the main opportunities in the markets for companies that, are start, that, that wanna start working in Brazil, that have uh, expectations for offshore wind for the next coming. Okay, uh, I explain a little bit what Abiolica is working, some studies, and now we're going for uh, offshore study. This is a study uh, made by Abiolica and its members. So that was a study, 11 technical notes, is one of the biggest studies, uh, I could say, in the world about offshore wind energy, uh, around 500 pages of studies uh, talking about transmission, port and logistics infrastructure, cost and for forecasts about LCOE, uh, the status quo of regulatory framework, and other different subjects that we believe that will be important for offshore wind. Uh, one good thing is that you can find this study in English in our website. So uh, if you want to check it out, just go to the Abeolica website and look in for value chain studies. That, we, that, you, that you will find out. That was an amazing study, a study conducted also by the Copetec, Essence, and Abeolica with our members. Okay, I'll go in some details of the study because it's a big study. So uh, first of all, when we talk about offshore wind, we have to consider uh, port and logistics infrastructure. So we need adaptations. We have uh, we have a lots of ports in Brazil. Some of, some ports are, are already working on. We have here on the uh, on our room some guys from Porto do Açu 
which uh, are helping and discussing uh, how how they can adapt the, the port infrastructure to receive all these projects. So if you see the dimensions of the components they are really have, and that there are a lots of tons of these components, that that's what that's why we need to adapt the soil of this uh, this this port. Uh, um, all these components. Uh, and I would like to talk already. So uh, I mentioned Porto do Rio Grande and saying these are ports that are already working. Uh, they have good planning uh, and are, are already mapped potential of the areas around the port. So this could be really helpful to start talking about research and development. So we go and they have a really uh, interesting case, which is the catapult. So uh, uh, the parts here start talking about the possibilities to construct an inv uh, innovation ecosystem uh, like the UK and could be really interesting if we have this for Brazil. So, uh, really uh, well mentioned for my friends, we, we have here uh, some challenges for uh, transmission lines. These challenges based, uh, are based in forming points, project localization, uh, alignment of the schedules, offshore uh, wind transmission, and environmental aspects. So, we know that we have in Brazil a challenge of a lot of grants for uh, onshore and solar energy, but as really well mentioned to Josina, we have time to prepare our schedule for offshore wind. Uh, do a, a tendering for auction of the area doesn't mean that we have to do an energy auction for the moment. So this is a really important advice for everyone because we have to establish a way to give a signal of the interesting of the entrepreneurs, right? So this is a challenge that we know that we have, but we still have to talk about, uh, about the assignment procedures of the area. And that's what we are doing about regulatory framework. So uh, why, to, why we should have offshore wind energy? Mainly we talk about three pillars that are really important and go um, coordinated with discussions about the New Green Deal and IRA. So uh, we look for security and access, environmental and uh, sustainability, and also economic development and growth. When we talk about offshore wind, people say uh, about the costs and um, the, the points that that we approach when we talk about competitiveness, right? But uh, we also believe that offshore wind can be a way to promote a macroeconomic approach. And when I talk about macroeconomic approach, we talk about the jobs that we can generate. We talk about the possibilities, the synergy between oil and gas that's really well established here in Brazil. And we have a bunch of oil and, oil and gas companies here. So I thanks for you guys to being here because this is a really important moment to push up offshore wind energy in Brazil. So uh, talking about cost reduction, some actions about innovation has been taken in the last years uh, related about cost reduction, advances in technology, increased supply chain, and creation of new markets, and goes uh, in an approach to look for the different stages of the projects. So these are some innovations that we have here. Uh, since of planning and expansion of the air to map the resource potential to the actions of the turbines. Uh, smart um, smart uh, facilities when we talk about artificial intelligence intelligence that's of things structure all of this is being discussed to be uh, a way to pave uh, the trajectory for offshore wind energy but we still have some challenges to face right so uh, the ch five different uh, things that we have to take care for the next years first environmental and when we talk about all these 180 gigawatts submitted for licensing process forget a regulation right so we are discussing with the different competent bodies to have this regulation in place to promote the uh, assignment procedures right so the second point is an institutional regulatory approach so we are discussing the bill we are discussing the decree we believe both uh, regulatory approaches could be helpful for the sector, but we see also that the CRE already gave us many directions. We cannot lose these directions. And if, if we can complement for both ways, Bill and the decree will be wonderful as well. 
Uh, when we talk about the technological challenges and prices, yeah, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. When we talk about uh, technologies and prices, we can see uh, the cost reductions is uh, an issue that we are discussing. We're talking about innovations. We ta we're talking about uh, different things that we can do to promote the, the reduction of the costs. But we have to remember also that during the years that we'll do, uh, do, do that we will do the assignment procedures of the area and probably we'll do the energy auction we will have a, a, a reduction of these costs so these challenges will be uh, really important for us and the role of universities are really important as well because we will promote innovation we will promote research we see the research that Milad brought for us that are really important to see uh, how the levelized cost of energy will evolve for the next coming years. Also, the market, this is an issue that we are not discussing right now because we wanna have, first of all, the assignments of the area and for the last, but uh, still is important, the import infrastructure, transmission and logistics. So these are the main points that I bring for you today. Uh, I would like to say, if you guys wanna know more data about Abeolica, please just check our website, Instagram. You can find a, a podcast that we have called Cabeça de Vento, uh, which is really uh, funny that you can find many nice informations, uh, really educative informations. We invite universities, we invite people from the government to help in our discussions. So this is, Elbia, our executive president, she's taking the word of Abeolica. She's also vice chair from GEOAC, Global Wind Energy Council, and she's really engaged uh, in all discussions of offshore wind. She had the opportunity to be in the COP in the last years, so she brings the word of the importance of offshore wind. And uh, have you here in this table, guys? It's really, uh, it's really grateful to take the word of offshore wind to Brazil. So I would like to say obrigado, uh, and I've, I'm available to help in anything you need. Thank you. Thank you, Mateus. Thank you, Abeolica. Very nice presentation. So, yeah, so we, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have the questions at the final of the uh, final of the block. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we started the event with the twenty minutes of delay, so we have to run. <laughs> Uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, the re representative of ASUPORT, uh, Fernanda, please. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you. I'll make it quick. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Millet, for inviting us today to share a little bit of our case. Uh, it's been a very interesting morning. Um, and I would also like to thank you, uh, the other panelists here, because they really set the scene <laughs> in the national context, so it would be easier to just connect what we are doing. Uh, and I, what I'm going to show here is a very high-level uh, presentation of our uh, development strategy. And it's all, it's all connected and based on the, the federal and the state policies for developing uh, and the policies for the energy transition. And we we saw previously in the Josina presentation and Matheus presentation, uh, a lot of challenge that the country that we have to, to seize the opportunity that we have ahead, but we have a huge opportunity. We have resources uh, and we have natural uh, vocation for, for renewable energy and and the uh, and the uh, and we as Brazilians and we as private sector and public and the universities has, uh, we all have our roles to play and together we can uh, we can contribute and accelerate the the whole development in the country, and we do believe that. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, who we are. Uh, saying about who is part of us too. And I'm sorry about the presentation, the presentation is in Portuguese, but uh, we're going to share the English version with you later. Um, so we are private port. Uh, for those who don't know, we are located in Rio de Janeiro, in the north of Rio. Um, uh, we start our operation in 2014. So we are a very, very new port. Uh, from 2014, 
to uh, today, we have 10 uh, private terminals in operation. We ended last year, 2022, with 57 million tons handled uh, in the port. Uh, and 22,000 port calls. We're talking about 500 port calls per, per month. It's a, it's a very significant number. Uh, in this uh, 15 years of development and aid of operations, we already occupied 15% of our area. So uh, that means that we have 85% area available, a total of uh, 44 square kilometers, a lot of area, and this is a very important aspect when it comes to developing the, the, the industry and the, and the whole strategy that I'm going to show a little bit here. Uh, we are also, we have now uh, around 7,000 uh, um, direct jobs and uh, we have a natural reserve for Restinga uh, conservation where we foster all of our biodiversity projects and uh, uh, in the in the for the the port development the industrial development uh, that oh I'm sorry that said just uh, just to 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 explain a little bit of what we already have um, we have some uh, very important operations already occurring in the port uh, for instance we have the third uh, export operation for IRR in a project uh, uh, from Prumo Logistica and Anglo American. We also export one third, percent, uh, one third of the national petroleum, the now crude oil, by vast terminal. And we have a LNG terminal uh, that supplies natural gas to the power, uh, to the power plants of Gas Natural Asu, which already has a power plant of 1.5 gigawatts in, in operation and uh, another 1.7 gigawatts in installation phase. It is uh, together the biggest uh, 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 thermal uh, park, thermal power plant uh, complex in the whole Latin America. It's a very expressive operation. And this, this, this operation and the, the oil ones have already projects to expansion, so to connect uh, the, the port to the, to the national grid of uh, gas pipelines, oil pipelines that will uh, support the industrialization the next phases. Uh, we also have uh, important operations for the oil and gas industry, which is another uh, aspect that's very relevant when it comes to, uh, to accelerate the poor development that will support the offshore wind industry in the next, uh, in the next years and next, next decades. So we have uh, the largest uh, offshore supply base in Brazil, that it's uh, operated by Edson Show West, and also uh, 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 terminals and manufacturing of flexible pipelines from Technip FMC and NOV, and uh, and other uh, uh, supply bases for the the oil and gas operations. Uh, this this whole this whole operations that I mentioned here very quickly, uh, it 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 shows what. Uh, where we are, what we have, and they are all very uh, important aspects for the next phase of industrialization uh, for, the, for what we are going to share right now. Uh, this is uh, uh, a little bit of uh, a draw of, of our strategy, we call, what we are calling Green Pod, how we see and we are planning and preparing uh, the port complex as a platform for the industrialization, uh, as looking for the context of the energy transition and what the 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 cultural need, the domestic demand, uh, the, the the future domestic demand, the future market, and also the global market, we organized our uh, we our, our whole strategy and our master plan as. Um, it's important to say, as a port administrator and a port developer, uh, we we uh, we are we are responsible for the port master plan, uh, and this is a very important document that uh, uh, that is how we organize the the whole uh, geographic space um, to to foster this this development digitalization. So uh, that means that we are organizing 
the different types of future industry uh, and the whole and the whole utilities, so we can work better uh, in a in an ecosystem and and more efficient, more sustainable, and more circular inside the, the port and connected with the national grid and the offshore operations in front of us. So we're in one in one side we're talking about uh, increasing the renewable energy, uh, not only with uh, offshore wind, but also onshore wind, uh, uh, solar generation for for some projects there in the port, and uh, we are studying biomass uh, potential in the region. This this whole uh, renewable energy that we are uh, we are aiming to 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 increase the 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 availability of the renewable energy. I'm sorry, uh, uh, it's, it's connected to with the whole the whole industrialization, the low carbon industrialization that we are talking about, and we are looking for the hydrogen as a as a um, energy vector for this whole industrialization. So uh, and, and and I'm going to show how we are we are uh, starting this project that is in license process here in the state, and connected with this whole uh, this whole other part that's going to need the hydrogen and it's going to need the the natural gas to establish their 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 development in the port area, both to supply domestic demand but also to export. As we are port and we have port infrastructure, we are looking for global demand as well. Um, so, talking about hydrogen, uh, uh, we we are you are going to read up, uh, hear about it uh, the second semesters. We uh, we started last year a conceptual project for a hydrogen hub. To, uh, that will that will host not only the hydrogen products production, blue or green or some other colors in between, but also uh, low carbon methanol and low carbon ammonia. Looking for the the market demands that we are already foreseeing. Uh, this hub will start, of course, in small uh, in pilot scales in research and development scales. Uh, and grow in uh, medium uh, industrial scales and then in large scales. Uh, this whole uh, hub will supply to the uh, different industrial hubs. Uh, the, the, main, the main hub is that we are uh, uh, studying right now and we are having a lot of developments and studies and uh, also, also, also conceptual projects. Uh, is uh, the green steel uh, industry and its demand, and also the fertilizers. So the the this, this two uh, the, they are showing a lot of, of of demand and potential to be developed in the port, connected to our strategy, and we are talking with very relevant players about it. Uh, and the third one that we are a really uh, really. Uh, Seeing a lot of demand and, and, and is connecting with our strategy is, is the, the alternative fuels and the low carbon fuels, not only for uh, the maritime sector, but also to the, the inland transportation. Uh, some of the big numbers of the project that we are starting, uh, we actually are finning to the environmental impact assessment and, and already discussing uh, the 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 next phase with the environmental agency here in Rio de Janeiro in Rio. we're talking about in in the, the full capacity for gigawatts of electrolyzers so we are talking about uh, uh, at the end of the project it's, it's a big number we're talking about 20 years of development uh, for gigawatts that will uh, that can have the capacity that we have the capacity to produce looking to the efficiency that we have right now and of course we believe that will be higher when when the decades passes, we're talking about 600,000 tons per year, two million tons of ammonia, and uh, uh, 315,000 tons a year of e-methanol in its full capacity. This is a big numbers, and we are of, uh, we are developing the the concept of the projects. We will start in the first phase with the pilots, with the 
with the with small uh, capacities, and we already have some uh, important players with us uh, uh, discussing how to develop these projects um, in in the port area. And the other one that we'll just uh, drill down before uh, we move uh, move forward is a little bit of how we are seeing and preparing ourselves to receive and accelerate the offshore wind industry here in the southeast region. We saw in the maps uh, the, the, the hotspots here when it comes to wind resources. We are uh, in front of one of these hotspots. Uh, Mateus and, jo and Josina showed here that we have a lot of projects in front of us too, uh, already being, uh, being uh, started the, li the licensing process in Ibama. Uh, we are talking about 14 projects already, 33 gigawatts. Uh, and well, we are a port, we have port, port infrastructure, and we are energy port. So we are we have already important connections to the national grid and studies for amplify this connection and and, and uh, to so we can uh, have the the future energy production and uh, connected to the national grid. Uh, just uh, just to zoom up and, and show what we have in front of us and some of the players that we are discussing. We have already MOUs and we are discussing further developments when it comes to uh, offshore wind. But the, the important things here, uh, just to 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 sum up and and conclude how we are facing and preparing ourselves is that we are not talking about only be a Support for support the installation and the operation of the wind farms, but we are talking about uh, the bring together the whole chain. We have available area, uh, as we saw before. Uh, the, the Brazil has a supply chain that can uh, that can be that, that can develop the the, the a domestic uh, more robust supply chain for the offshore wind. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to to the whole benefits benefits that the what this industry can uh, can bring to the country, we are talking about the one stop shop for the for the offshore wind development. When we can uh, have together the logistic base, the marshalling areas, but also the manufacturing uh, uh, of the parts of the of for the wind shore. So for the wind industry, I'm sorry. So uh, that is how we are organizing ourselves and preparing uh, the port, the, the area that we have available and organizing our master plan so we can foster this, the, this whole supply chain for the, the offshore wind. And accelerate, of course, uh, when, the, when the time comes, this development here in the southeast region in front of the port. So, well, I would like to thank you. Uh, very much. I hope that that, that we we could share uh, a little bit, a high level of in high level of what we are uh, of, of what we're doing there in Yasu. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fernanda, for your nice presentation. Uh, the next presentation, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have Equinor. Uh, the speaker is Andre Leite, who is the head of offshore wind in Brazil and Latin America. So he's uh, participating online. So I would like to ask to put him on the screen to see him and his presentation. Okay, here we go. Andre, please. Good morning. Okay. okay. Good morning. Good Thank morning. You. There is an echo there. Is there. Let me see. Could be something from my side. Better? I, I think so, yes. Better. Yeah, thank you. So, the, first of all, thanks for the invitation. Very glad to be here. Um, I'm not uh, very good uh, at IT systems, but I guess that I'm able to control the presentation here. So, let's see how it goes. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we are doing in Equinor regarding offshore wind. Okay. 
Okay, we have some technical problem. I'm trying to contact him to see if, if it's from maybe his internet. Okay, he's uh, reconnecting with the internet. Let's let's wait some seconds. Okay, he's trying to reconnect his notebook and uh, um, just want to thank you again for who is participating here. Uh, Abel Olica, EPE, Total, I just seen the Sinoc from China, and Neo Energia, Petrobras, and uh, researchers from university, Technip. So uh, maybe we are here to actually to uh, make possible this, this network for you and actually present our activities and to see if uh, searching for the actually uh, opportunities and uh, possible collaboration with the Canada, of course. So now we are waiting for Andrea to reconnect. Uh, this is normal, of, of course, technical problems. It, it facilitated yeah, facilitate the communication, but yeah, of course. Laura, please. Gente, só para me apresentar, quem não me conhece, meu nome é Laura, eu falei com vocês ali antes, pelo, pelo, do carro, né? É, eu moro em Niterói, não deu para chegar a tempo aqui, desculpe. É uma honra estar aqui com o professor Segen, que já foi meu chefe. <risos> É, incrível Laboratório de Tecnologia Submarina, é, queria agradecer o convite e me colocar à disposição. Por onde que eu subo aqui? Ah, tem uma aqui. Deixa eu, vocês possam me ver direito. Aqui. Então, é, queria me colocar à disposição de vocês, né, para... Eu vi que tem estudos aí, a Beólica... Matheus falou, né, que tem estudos feitos com, com o Reino Unido. É, eu gostaria muito de promover uma aproximação aí nessa área, né? É, e com vocês todos, né? O Canadá falou-se muito sobre hidrogênio. O Canadá é um, bem forte nessa área também, né? Tem, existem no Canadá fabricantes de eletrolizadores, por exemplo, fuel cell, é, empresas de engenharia que estão bem acostumadas a fazer esse tipo de trabalho, então, vocês precisando fazer contato com alguma empresa ou com o governo canadense para ter uma, um benchmark aí do, do, do Canadá, é, a gente está à disposição para fazer essa conexão, esse é meu, meu trabalho, tá? Então, fiquem à vontade para entrar em contato comigo, eu tenho aqui uns cartões, posso deixar com professor Milade também, vocês fiquem à vontade para entrar em contato, tá bom? Obrigada. Agora... Agora vamos ter que jogar carta, né? Você quer que eu falo algumas coisas? Eu acho que ele está reconectando, podemos trocar. Ok, let's, 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 let's change the presentation, it's better. So I would like to invite the representative from Petrobras Sempes, the research center of Petrobras, to for for his presentation. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is da Daniel Daniel Faro. Uh, thanks for the invitation for this excellent meeting. I'm replacing my manager, Andre Bello. Is, is a, he's a manager for technical uh, development, research and development for energy and decarbonization in Petrobras. So, they just to give a, a technical overview what we are doing in Petrobras for offshore wind. Like this. Ah, sorry. So what we, are, uh, we intend to, to talk about, 
just some few slides from our strategic plan and some insights from technology point of view. <laughs> As we have some strategic plan, sorry, strategic plan here, we, we need to have some disclaimers. Uh, when you see our uh, climate goals, we see uh, our ambition for neutralizing emissions and also some uh, specific goals for the intensity of uh, emissions in, for, uh, for greenhouse gases for our operations in production, mainly in EAMP uh, uh, in Presalt. So when you see these emissions, the main part of these emissions in platforms and came from power generation. So it brings a nice opportunity to uh, uh, wind energy as we have a clean and, and renewable uh, source and offshore. Um, so this, this point of view, we see this, this opportunity regarding the, the connection of uh, offshore wind to our operations. And in a second point of view, also from our strategic plan, we see that last year we had some studies to verify what would be uh, some new motors for Petrobras as a, a profitable diversification of source. So uh, it was chosen three main uh, uh, themes, and one of them is was offshore wind. So now the, the point of view is different. It's not like to in integrate it with oil gas, but to have it as a, a different source of uh, a motor, a new motor for Petrobras. So when you see these two point of views, how it how it deals with the 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 how it contributes to reducing the intensity of emissions in Petrobras value chain. So if you think, how can I I, I point here? Ah, okay. I, I just <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, when is when we talk about grid uh, wind energy integrated to grid, uh, the point of view is to have a reduction of a greenhouse gases emission from the value chain. So our final product will will would we have a, a less uh, emission associated to the energy uh, produced and, and given to the the customer. When you go to oil and gas, as I said. Is the reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gases emission from the operations? So the the production barrel of petroleum would be uh, uh, would have less uh, uh, emissions associated. So this is this case directed connection to platforms. And the the third one is a mix of both. When you have offshore wind integrated to the grid and also to our operations, so we would have both. So when you analyze these applications, um, when you go to offshore wind to the grid, we have released recently, last, last month, that we are evaluating together with Equinor these seven projects in all of Brazil, in Northeast, Southeast, and South. Uh, it, it, ha uh, it has more than about 14.5 gigawatts of projects. So this is the the main activity that we are doing in, in this evaluation for all these uh, uh, possible soft projects uh, uh, connected directly to the grid is the, the point of view of diversification. When you see the uh, the oil and gas, we have some some opportunities here that we are being evaluated inside Petrobras. Uh, the main of, of them are uh, uh, a wind turbine supply energy to uh, subsea equipment and also uh, wind turbine supplying energy to platforms. Uh, there is some difference and different opportunities. Here, uh, mainly if you have water injection system, the reservoir of the what would just receive the water could handle with all the fluctuation of the power. So it's easier not to have a, a necessity of a storage system and it will also have some management uh, of generation to uh, deal with all the fluctuation of the production. When you go to a, a platform, in this case, we will need to have a, a, a gas turbine as power backup 
it means we need to keep all the, the original generation and uh, and of course we will have only the the average energy supplied so we you have also to to handle all the fluctuation with the gas turbines well both cases are some advantages that we are modular solutions uh, you you can bring one two or three uh, uh, wind turbines directly connected to to a platform or even some modular projects with wind turbine directly connected to uh, uh, subsea equipments. Uh, but for another side, we have some high cost associated to deep water scenario as the main application in Petrobras are uh, in press out. So we have a, a water deficit from more than 2000 meters. When you uh, link it both, we could have for some place the opportunity to have everything integrated. It means a uh, wind farm, a commercial wind farm integrated to grid and also integrated to oil and gas. In this case, when it's possible, we have this uh, 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 considered stable power as the grid would, would make this, this role. Just giving some history of wind energy uh, at Petrobras to see you uh, from where we came and uh, what are we doing now. Uh, we started in 2001 with uh, uh, onshore wind, uh, beginning with uh, measuring. We installed more than 50 met mesh in Brazil from south to north. Um, it allows us to, to know the results, to know what, what are the main differences in resource from north to northwest uh, uh, and, and, and south. Uh, after that, we make a, a installation of a power plant in Macau, Rio Grande do Norte. It's interesting because it was very integrated with oil and gas. It was inside the field of, our, of production. And also, it was connected with two little platforms near the coast. It allowed us to turn off the two diesel generators. So, it gives us the first project of uh, uh, carbon uh, compensation in Petrobras. 80, 80 years after that, we installed the first uh, uh, commercial wind farm, which was wind sick, also in Rio Grande do Norte. Okay, so all the experience uh, uh, bring it brought from the, the power uh, resource management and the pilot plant brings was bring to this uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, plant. So after that, we started with uh, uh, offshore wind, the same, trying to do the same way. It's starting for measuring the results, knowing the results. So we installed the MetMass in a platform. Uh, we did more than two years of measurement. And together with this MetMass, we had some lighters installed in different platforms. So it was, uh, uh, it was an opportunity to know different points and make a, a resource map with uh, uh, three or four points of different uh, different points of validation. So the difference to have only a, a map uh, uh, from models and uh, to have a map that was validated for various points. Uh, here in uh, uh, 2018. We, we made the conceptual for a wind pilot plant, offshore wind. The idea was to implement this one, but uh, we stopped it for different uh, reasons. Uh, but it was very good for us because we involved our team, our research team, our engineering teams, our, the people from environmental license, and it, give, it gave us a, a very, uh, with knowledge for uh, uh, for the source. Also for Brazil, I think it was very important as we, we go to Ibama, uh, we make some the, the report for license. Uh, I, I think uh, it was also, uh, sorry. Uh, it pushed the regulatory discussion here in Brazil. Uh, still in uh, 2020, we did a lot of studies with different institutions about supply chain, electrical connection, foundation, or again, uh, with wind resource, with new techniques. So 
that's something that we are uh, uh, making a big effort to try to understand all the, the main challenges to go ahead with offshore wind. Well, for now, now it's the, the dates that we, we intend to, to finish these main projects. Uh, as we said before, we have two contests, uh, diversification of our business and also decarbonization of oil and gas operations. So the main projects that we are running now is the development of a float system for measuring offshore wind. Uh, we already have it in the waters. We, we go to our second concept uh, uh, for this buoy. And the idea is to, to bring it to a, a pre-commercial phase uh, in the near, fu near future. Also, uh, regarding the, the water depths that we have for our oil and gas operation, we are developing some uh, concept of uh, floating wind uh, uh, considering a uh, water depth more than 2,000 meters. So these projects are, are analyzing, verifying what, what are the best concepts considering the platform, the mooring system, and, uh, and the main concepts uh, also regarding the mid-ocean conditions that you found in, in Brazil. Um, together, these, these projects uh, intend to evaluate it all the uh, logistics in Brazil uh, and develop a, a tool that allow us to optimize uh, the planning of installation of a, a, a wind farm, also taking into consideration the resource, the layout of the park, also the mid ocean conditions. So it would take everything in consideration in a geographic season to allow us to have the better proposition to uh, define the location and the methodology to install the, the wind farm. Oh, sorry. Here is a, it's a project to evaluate the, the main characteristic of the soil in Northwest. We, we find that we have some conditions there with beach rocks, we have a layer, we have a very hard layer uh, uh, in the seabed that would be a big problem to to have monopile foundation there. So what you're doing there is uh, take some samples of soil in different positions and evaluating all the characteristics, geophysical characteristics to to give the, the engineering people uh, uh, some uh, uh, variables to consider in the project. And so for the, again, okay, sorry. For, for what we are discussing now, uh, different techniques for seabed characterization, also, as I said before, uh, pre-commercial phase of the floating LIDAR, and uh, different other techniques to, that would help us to develop offshore wind projects. Okay, uh, and just a, a point that's linked to what uh, Professor Milad showed us before, uh, as we we also are evaluating some oil and gas activities in all this region here, and uh, as we we already it was already shown the wind potential uh, uh, for Brazil that we see that we have a good potential here in this this place in the northwest, but not in that path, but for a current resource. Sorry, we see here a good resource. So. We are evaluating uh, the viability of to use uh, uh, marine current power in this place instead of uh, offshore wind power. So it's an uh, alternative uh, uh, marine uh, uh, energy for this, this situation. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel, for the presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, let's move to the last presentation.